Hello, everyone, and welcome to Infectious Disease Virtual Event. My name is Paramars Valafar, and I'm a professor in biomedical informatics at San Diego State University. I will be presenting on the diagnosis and treatment of tuberculosis, a case study in challenges and threats posed by infectious diseases. Uh, please feel free to submit questions during my presentation, and I will follow up with you via email. Now, moving on. Okay, um, I will be talking, uh, I will be focusing on three specific areas. First, on the epidemiology of the disease. Next, on the diagnostic challenges. And the, last, uh, and the last point that I will discuss are some disruptive emerging technologies that offer the potential for significant advances. Now, first about uh, the transmission of the disease. As we all know, tuberculosis uh, is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. It transmits through the air. Uh, usually cells uh, that are stuck together, about two or three cells uh, at a time, uh, they travel through the air and enter the airways of a, a second host. Uh, usually, uh, if more than two or three cells are stuck together, they create a larger mass and they become uh, more difficult to travel through the airways. And so the infectious uh, uh, potential of such large masses is actually lower. Now, uh, it's a, this is a bacterium that is uh, fairly slow growing. It multiplies about uh, once every 24 hours. If you compare that to, uh, say, uh, uh, other, uh, even Mycobacterium uh, smegmatis, uh, which is in the same uh, group, uh, smegmatis grows, uh, multiplies about once every half an hour. So, um, given that it's uh, growing so slowly, um, it, it's actually a surprise that it has spread so successfully all around the world. It, um, it infects, uh, well, uh, the active form of the disease. Um, we uh, see it about 9 million times every year. So 9 million new people are a developed active form of the disease. 1.5 million die from it. And that's uh, quite successful. It, uh, uh, and if you count uh, the estimation for the last 200 years is that 1 billion people have died from this disease. Uh, that's quite a number compared to the Ebola outbreak that we had in 2011 and 2012. Um, in that outbreak, about 28,000 people died. Uh, this disease kills 1.5 million every year. So it's the biggest infectious disease killer. Recently, it passed HIV. And there are some uh, uh, very good reasons why this is the most uh, uh, successful uh, uh, human pathogen. The first one is actually its slow growth rate. So um, this bacterium grows slowly. As a result, it makes the patient uh, ill uh, slowly, and it kills the host very slowly. Keep in mind that uh, for a pathogen like this that tra you know, travels through the air, if it, uh, it kills the host rapidly, it also loses the uh, ability to infect other hosts. So it's actually an advantage for this pathogen to slowly kill the host. The other advantage that it has is its uh, great ability to uh, uh, regulate its metabolism. It's opportunistic. It can uh, turn itself off and go into latency. And when the immune system is compromised, either because of a disease like HIV or some trauma, it can reactivate itself. And when it faces drug pressure, antibiotic treatment, it also has the ability to revert back to its latency. So many cases where we think that the disease has uh, 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 or the infection has actually cleared. The reality is that it's reverted to its latency and it's waiting for the antibiotic pressure to, to be reduced. There are several other reasons. Uh, one is um, HIV epidemic. It works synergistically with HIV and the mortality rate is much higher in the HIV positive populations. 
uh, the bacteria makes HIV uh, much more virulent, and HIV uh, makes it easier for uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis to enter the macrophage, uh, uh, which is where it uh, usually resides. Then uh, the bacterium has this mysterious ability to rapidly adapt. And when I say rapidly, this is a relative statement. Um, and it's relative to its slow growth rate. Uh, but uh, fairly soon uh, after the introduction of new antibiotics, this happened the last time in 2016, fairly soon the bacterium uh, 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 adapts and resistance to those antibiotics emerge. Already uh, resistance to antibiotics that we introduced in 2016 Already in 2017, we had that uh, uh, resistance emerging. Um, when a disease spreads as broadly and as widely as this one, it also has the ability to break down national uh, control programs. And when that happens, then the disease spreads even faster. And finally, uh, more recently, migration has become easier and this disease migrates with the hosts all over the world. So um, among all those reasons why this pathogen is so successful, I wanted to talk about um, resistance. The uh, first category of resistance is called multi-drug resistance, and that's when uh, the bacterium becomes resistant to the two most powerful drugs, uh, first-line drugs, that's isonizin and rifampicin. And the map that you see on the screen uh, shows how uh, widely spread this form of the disease is. In 2016, 490,000 new cases of MDR-TB uh, were diagnosed, and uh, it is a, an estimation uh, because many of the people who uh, suspect they have this form of the disease, they actually, there's a stigma attached and they uh, are lost to follow. Unfortunately, the treatment success for uh, this variety of the disease is about 50%. And uh, so people who know this and they get the message that they might have MDR-TB, either they don't believe it, or they lose hope and they are lost to uh, follow up. The next level of resistance is extensively drug, uh, uh, drug resistance. This is uh, uh, the case when uh, MDR TB has been established. So resistance to rifampicin and isoniazin ha has been determined. Additionally, the bacteria are resistant to at least one fluoroquinolone group of drugs and also one, at least one injectable group of the, uh, drugs, something like amicacin, canamycin, or caprimycin. Um, so uh, incidence of XDR increased tenfold between 2002 and 2012. This goes in the face of some of the early assumptions that we have that uh, the more resistant the bacterium becomes, uh, the less fit it becomes because mutations that cause resistance also have a fitness cost. And so initially there was a thinking that the more resistant bacteria wouldn't spread, but the map that you see says otherwise. Um, and again, unfortunately, the success rate in treatment of XDRTB is even worse, and that's 34%. Now, um, if that wasn't enough, we also have the category of totally drug-resistant tuberculosis. This is an informal definition not adapted by the World Health Organization for many reasons, including political. Um, and because it is informal, it has different definitions by different groups. It was first uh, uh, detected in Italy, then it was reported in India and South Africa, and several other countries have since joined that group. Uh, the group in India, which were a collabor uh, collaborative group with uh, uh, our group, they uh, reported a strain that was resistant to 23 different antibiotics. The South Africa group reported a strain that was resistant to nine. Both were referred to uh, as 
TDR-TV by the respective groups. Now, in terms of diagnostics, as you can imagine, these different levels of resistance uh, are difficult to identify uh, for many reasons, cost, time, uh, but as well as uh, the different platforms that are needed to determine all the, uh, the resistance to all the different drugs. Now, uh, what I'm showing on the screen is a slide from, that I have borrowed from the WHO, and it shows the different categories of platforms that are available. The most common platform uh, is, the, uh, is a group of uh, platforms that uh, are growth-based. This means that they grow the bacteria in presence of the drug, and there's a time as well as colony size threshold. So if within a certain time, the colony size becomes a certain uh, uh, size, then they uh, classify that bacteria uh, as resistant. If it doesn't, then it's classified as susceptible to that drug. These are by far the most common currently. Um, the next group of uh, 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 diagnostic methods are uh, molecular based. Uh, the biggest advantage of these tests uh, is that they are rapid. Because this is a very slow growing bacteria, uh, uh, growth based methods typically take several weeks, sometimes up to a month, before we know uh, that a case is resistant to a certain drug. And during that one month, uh, the wrong treatment is given and the pathogen has the opportunity to infect others. Molecular tests are rapid, and typically the results are known within days. Um, there's a huge amount of development going on right now. Uh, the uh, box that is highlighted on the screen is the set that is endorsed by WHO, but there's a whole lot of other platforms, uh, the additional boxes on the side. Some are scheduled to be tested by the WHO. Some have not, uh, but are being developed. So there's a large group there. And finally, there's a group that is, uh, uh, cannot be categorized as any one of those two groups. Um, uh, for example, microscopy that's used for uh, detection of TB, but not typically uh, for uh, determination of resistance. Now, I wanna focus on molecular diagnostics because that uh, holds the greatest potential for rapid and accurate diagnostics. Um, the slide that you see um, uh, describes why the current platforms are facing a challenge. And let me back up and uh, say that the current platforms rely on previous knowledge acquired through research uh, that has identified targets that these molecular uh, uh, diagnostic platforms then uh, include and they will look at uh, only those regions of the genome and they see whether there are mutations in those specific locations. Yeah. If there are mutations, then they will classify that bacterium as resistant. If there is no mutation in that loc uh, locus, then they classify it as susceptible. Now, what you see on the screen is the list of uh, uh, first and second line drugs, the most common ones. You also see the, in the second column the list of genes that are implicated in uh, 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 emerging uh, resistance to those drugs. For example, if I pick um, isoniazid, CAT-G, and the promoter of INHA are uh, the low side that uh, commonly we see mutations that cause resistance. For rifampicin, another first-line drug, uh, RPOD is, is the most common gene. And when, when we say gene, usually there are hot spots within those genes, so it's not the entire gene that is uh, a, a mutations cause resistance. In RPOD, for example, there's a, a rifampicin-determining region uh, uh, referred to uh, as RRDR, that uh, mutations in that region are uh, 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 assume to cause resistance. Now, the biggest problem here is uh, the third column is shown in the third column. 
As you can see, the sensitivity of the mutations that we have so far discovered uh, in identifying resistance to these drugs uh, is uh, a bit far from uh, the perfect that we would like it to be. The best one is rapampicin. It's uh, the one that is, is the model that is uh, working the best. But uh, as you can see, for instance, for canamycin, uh, that percentage drops down to high 70s. This offers two uh, 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 challenges and concerns. One is that about uh, uh, 20 uh, uh, percent, depending on the drug, of course, of resistant cases we will miss if we exclusively use these types of molecular diagnostic platforms. These are unusual cases where they don't have the expected mutations, but still they are phenotypically resistant. So, <clears throat> some challenges uh, that uh, those who work in uh, the area of developing molecular diagnostics need to face. First is that there could be alternative mechanisms of resistance. And this has been shown already by many groups, including my own group, that these do exist. And so as a result, a platform that is focused uh, to detect mutations in a specific locus will miss these uh, alternative mechanisms. The, so the typical solution here is to use whole genome sequencing. Um, but even then, there are further complications. For example, epistasis could, could complicate things enormously. That's when multiple mutations work together to make uh, a case resistant. In such a case, it's not just a, another mutation in the genome that you're looking for, but another set of mutations. Um, so, uh, so far, people who have been trying to find epistatic effects uh, that cause resistance, they uh, typically use whole genome sequencing, and then they do combinatorial analysis. Uh, from the computing point of view, this has the challenge that combinatorial analysis, when you have thousands of mutations, is an MP-complete problem. That means that the solution for it exists in terms of coding and programming, but it only exists uh, uh, but, it, but it's only feasible for problems that are small. Once the count of mutations become thousands across the genome, it will take enormous amount of time to run, run that code. And so that's one problem. And the other problem is the curse of dimensionality, which is you have thousands of mutations, but you only have several hundred patients at a time. In order to uh, explore that high dimensional space, you really uh, require tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of patients, and that's infeasible. Current status, lots of effort, but we have little to show for. Um, I, I believe that a paradigm shift there is needed, and I'll talk a little bit about that shift in the next few slides. The other uh, challenge that we have, that the molecular diagnostic uh, uh, community as a whole uh, has been ignoring to a great deal so far, but now they are starting to consider that as a, uh, a distinct challenge that needs to be addressed. And that's heterogeneity. This is when a patient is the host to multiple populations. Um, in the simplest case, one subpopulation is susceptible to a drug, but a small subpopulation is resistant. In such a case, when we apply the antibiotics, the standard treatment, they will wipe out the population that is susceptible. The small uh, subpopulation will survive, grow, and is actually the one causing the infection, the active uh, infection. So um, because that subpopulation is so small at the beginning, it is difficult to detect. And therefore, most patients like that are classified as susceptible. Through uh, phenotyping approaches, those are the growth-based approaches, the sensitivity to detect a subpopulation that is resistant uh, ranges between 1 to 10 percent. Uh, that depends on the drug. Uh, however, on the molecular side, we are lacking. 
commonly, uh, when we do molecular analysis, we take the most frequent allele. And so that means that we are going to miss any subpopulation that is smaller than 50%. Current status, there's quite a bit of development in that area, actually. And so I'm hopeful that uh, this uh, challenge will be uh, mostly uh, uh, addressed in the near future. Improvement in sequencing technology uh, will greatly help, uh, especially if we can develop the ability to uh, sequence directly from the sputum, it will be very helpful. Um, the other part of this is epigenetics. Uh, epigenetics is the area that most molecular diagnostic platforms are, are completely ignoring right now. It's only in research that we run into this. But it's been shown by several groups, including our own, that epigenetics actually play an active role in uh, emergence of new phenotypes. They play a role in adaptation. They are uh, the mechanism that the bacteria use for rapid response to environmental pressure. And therefore, they are instrumental to uh, the bug's ability to survive and eventually to evolve and become resistance. We are currently in early stages of this. Uh, new tool development is underway, including uh, my own lab. And again, I think uh, we will see some significant advances in this area in the near future. Now, a few things about this bacterium uh, in order for us to understand what the challenges are. Um, first, this uh, 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 bug has a circular genome that is for about 4.4 megabases long. Unfortunately, 40% of the genome is genetic dark matter, meaning that we don't actually know what that 40% does. And also, unfortunately, it's a type 2 genome with uh, many small and large repeats. This presents a challenge for short read sequencing that has become so popular these days. Take, for instance, Illumina. Many of the repeats are so large that Illumina's short reads cannot map. The genome is circular, as I mentioned, but it is unbalanced. It's a very GC-rich genome. This also presents a challenge for sequencing platforms that have a, an amplification step built into the library prep and the pre-sequencing steps. The GC re uh, regions uh, do not uh, uh, equally amplify, and that presents a, an artificially uh, different view of those regions as compared to the rest of the genome. Um, culture preparation and DNA extraction takes variably long time. I talked about how long it takes for to grow these bacteria, but also for uh, reasons we don't fully understand, certain strains grow a bit faster, certain grow slower. So for platforms like Illumina that uh, offer uh, cheaper runs because of the economy of scale, it becomes a challenge to run uh, the uh, DNA of several strains together, unless you are running a laboratory that is tied to a, uh, 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 to a clinic that deals with a lot of cases of tuberculosis. So uh, specifically, I want to focus on uh, the challenges that uh, the, this genome offers to short read sequencing, and here I want to highlight Illumina because it's the most popular uh, uh, short read uh, whole genome sequencing platform out there. What you see on the background is uh, uh, the genome of M. tuberculosis map, that's the inner circle, and then the, uh, out, uh, the second circle from, uh, from the center is the GC content of that region of, of the genome. And what you see also is a, 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 are a red circles around uh, a, a, in the third layer. And those are uh, the blind spots that you see. And I'll explain what that means. Um, first, uh, the causes for these blind spots, these are 
at spots where uh, Illumina has a difficult time to sequence. Uh, there are two main causes. One is the high GC content, as I mentioned, and the second is the amplification bias. Uh, the third one that I have uh, forgotten to list here is those repeat regions. Consequences, inflated variation rate at some loci, and also missing important mechanisms in genome-wide association studies. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, I described the first three circles. The red one is the blind spots. Uh, the aqua color, the color circle uh, uh, denotes the repeat regions. That uh, shows where the uh, repeat segments are. And the last one, the outer circle, is uh, uh, regions where there is a very high GC content. And what you can see uh, in comparing is that, uh, first of all, if you put the whole thing together, you'll see that uh, these blind spots are scattered all over the genome. They are not focused in one area. And they cover about 3.5, 3.2% of the genome. Uh, that's roughly about 150,000 bases. So that's not a small amount. Many blind spots are explained by the high GC content. As you can see, the uh, last three circles overlap. Um, but some uh, cannot be explained by these. We don't fully understand why these blind spots are there. Uh, we use several thousand Illumina uh, uh, genomes that were uh, publicly available to uh, uh, discover these, uh, these uh, blind spots. Therefore, uh, these are common problems by the platform. Now, these blind spots functionally, they scatter uh, across multiple functional uh, domains. Of course, the largest is the group of PE and PPE genes. These are genes that are, uh, interact with the host immune system, uh, and it's the, defense it's the primary defense mechanism of the pathogen. These are mostly unknown genes. Uh, their functions are not clear uh, beyond what I just mentioned. And unfortunately, these blind spots seem to be uh, uh, popular uh, among these genes, and perhaps the reason why these are not studied uh, so well. But there are other uh, functional groups uh, as well. Uh, the red is the group of hypothetical genes. That's the dark matter, genomic uh, dark matter that I mentioned. We don't know what they do. Emerging solutions. Um, long read sequencing has solved many of these problems. It is still in the experimental phase, but some uh, really exciting uh, discoveries are already being reported. I'm showing three uh, uh, reports uh, published uh, just recently in scientific reports, as well as nucleic acid research, using uh, PacBio's smart sequencing to uh, report uh, novel discoveries in the genome, but also in the methylome, in the, uh, on the epigenetic uh, front. This is our pipeline, how we use PacBio. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a pipeline that performs uh, de novo assembly, circularization, consensus polishing, and then methylation detection and assembly QC. This pipeline not only assembles the genomes de novo, and so we have a, a full view of uh, uh, the genomes that uh, circularize, uh, including those repeat regions and high GC content. But we also assemble the methylome, and we are able to assess uh, epigenetic changes that may be associated with certain phenotypes. On the uh, a genetic front, this is uh, the first of our publications that uh, went out uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, this corrected the uh, uh, genetic basis for virulence that was earlier reported. We this, uh, did this study on H37RA that has the uh, attenuated uh, virulence. Uh, it's the avirulent version of uh, tuberculosis. and. That strain was compared to the virulent versions, and then the differences were, so it were uh, attributed to the genetic differences that cause virulence. When we sequenced it with PacBio, circularized 
uh, and assembled the uh, de novo genome and then circularized it, uh, we realized that most of those differences were actually sequencing errors. And so we had published our results in this manuscript. Um, alternative mechanisms of resistance, I mentioned this as a, as a, a, a huge challenge. In uh, the first manuscript on the top, we reported 11 uh, new mechanisms, new mutations that cause resistance. These are the ones that are commonly missed by uh, uh, typical molecular platforms today. Um, that's a big concern because we are really applying some sort of a, a type of selection. We are classifying those resistant cases as susceptible, allowing them to spread while we capture the uh, most prevalent mechanisms and eradicate them. Uh, in the second uh, manuscript that I've listed down below, we, uh, we did some molecular dynamics and demonstrated how those mutations uh, uh, cause resistance by uh, uh, basically strangling the channels that go to the heme inside of the cat G uh, uh, protein. Um, so that was isoniazid, one of the most powerful first-line drugs. Pyrazinamid is the second uh, uh, a drug from um, among the first-line drugs that we studied. And in the top uh, uh, manuscript, we reported over 100 new mutations that cause resistance. And in the manuscript down below, we then uh, wondered uh, if we discover so many how many others have other people, other uh, uh, groups have discovered? When we put all of that together in a systematic review, the result came to about a thousand different mutations in a single gene. Uh, that result was quite spectacular, and that study has been referenced a number of times so far. What we have learned, this is uh, sort of a summary of everything that I've said, majority uh, of Genomic changes is not due to point mutations. This is not something that got into, but it's a summary from everything that we've done in this lab using uh, long read sequencing. Um, on average, in an M. tuberculosis genome, uh, about 2,000 uh, point mutations we discover. However, 50,000 uh, bases are affected by all these other types of genomic changes. We completely are ignoring those changes at this point through molecular diagnostics. This is a big concern, and I'll explain in a minute why. Um, other types of variations could render point mutations inconsequential. So imagine a gene that is rendered uh, unexpressed. Uh, but we look at a mutation inside that gene to determine whether, uh, uh, whether that uh, bacterium is resistant or not. Whether that gene has a mutation or not is inconsequential if that gene is not being expressed. And that fact we are completely ignoring at this point. Phenotypic genotypic discordance can compromise a diagnostic accuracy, absence of the complete genome due to GC bias or repeats uh, is, a, is a big concern. Heterogeneity is also a big concern. We need to do a much better job in finding smaller subpopulations. MTB is evolving differently in different parts of the world. This has to do partly with uh, the uh, regimens that we choose in different parts of the world but also partly because of the ways we diagnose resistance. If we use molecular diagnostics in one part of the world, and then uh, we use our treatment decisions based on that, we are likely to uh, preferentially select for resistant mechanisms that are not common. And that has a huge risk. Uh, what we predict is that uh, if we go this route, a few years down the road, we will have a re-emergence of resistance, but this time with a very diverse set of uh, mechanisms, all the ones that we 
are missing today. Epigenetics plays a key role in persistence and emergence of resistance. We are completely ignoring that right now. Um, however, a, a few groups around the world are paying attention to that, and so new tools hopefully will emerge. Learning the evolutionary steps will allow, allow us to develop, uh, to detect the phenotypes much earlier, hopefully before that phenotype has uh, set foot and, and emerged. Uh, we can also develop much needed prognostic tools in addition to comprehensive diagnostics tools. The goal there is, can we predict the evolutionary path of a pathogen given uh, a, a, a regimen uh, that is being uh, used for treatment? If we can, then perhaps we can uh, predict the emergence of resistance before it uh, uh, does and stop it by changing the treatment. Current molecular diagnostics, as I mentioned, act as a selection mechanism. Um, if we catch the most common mechanisms and eradicate them, what we will see uh, is a uh, reduction in level of resistance in, uh, immediately. But a few years down the road, I fear that we will see all those uncommon mechanisms. They re-emerge, this time perhaps more fit, and if that happens, then we no longer can afford one set of recommended drugs for all the different uh, 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 cases around the globe. We will then have to come up with uh, recommendations uh, that are region specific, perhaps even personalized. Sensitivity and specificity, and for this very reason, sensitivity and specificity of molecular devices should be assessed annually. This is not being done currently. Uh, we still refer to publications about these devices that were uh, uh, done when the device was first introduced. Some of these devices are years old, and uh, but the bacterium is not static. It evolves constantly, and it, therefore, it may come up with me uh, mechanisms that these devices can no longer detect. We need to be aware of this and annually assess this risk. This is where I want to stop. Thank you for your attention. This is the group that I have, and I want to thank every one of them. They have played a key role in everything that I described. I want to also thank our uh, collaborators in other countries we have been working with. And I'm going to stop here. If there are any questions, I will uh, gladly answer through email.